Today we're going to talk about loss of protostasis with Chichilia. So hello everyone, today we're here with Cecilia Brunello from Helsinki University, where she currently works on synaptic plasticity, but I understand that your previous work was focused on how pathological tau may promote neurodegeneration, sounds like hard stuff. Is that correct? correct. Yes. yes. And she was nice enough to come over for a chat to talk about the loss of proteostasis, which is one of the hallmarks of aging. Mm. And frankly, very much related to Cecilia's expertise. And, by the way, we do have an episode on this topic, and you can go watch it over there. Yep, yeah, check it out, just right up here. Yep, and now to get to the topic, as the name sort of suggests, I take it proteostasis has to do with proteins. And as a non-scientist and an English major, I kind of totally forgot in the last few years what those are. So what are proteins exactly, and how do they work, what are they made of, where are they, where... <laughs> I'm very lost, <laughs> as you can tell. Yes, right. So, proteins are one of the functional and structural uh, units uh, uh, of our body mm -hmm. right, and of our cells. And uh, most importantly, they are the ones uh, encoded uh, by the genetic information uh, that uh, each of us uh, has in its uh, own DNA. Right. Okay. So for each protein that is made, uh, there is a code. And uh, the code determines uh, which amino acids, which are the smallest building block of each protein, uh, will be arranged. There are 20 amino acids in total, so you can imagine the amount uh, of uh, possible combination that yeah, we can get uh, yes. out of those 20 amino acids. And it's not only that, uh, because uh, in order for most of proteins to be functional, they have to assemble in a specific 3D structure. Okay. Right. So it will work in that 3D structure, but not in others. And uh, on top of that, uh, there can be other modifications, so small uh, additional units uh, can be added uh, to each protein to regulate their function. So many different layers uh, of regulations and um, uh, many different players as well. Uh, so where are they? They are a bit everywhere. They okay. uh, constitute uh, the the, the basis uh, of the structure of our cells, right. but uh, because there are different types of proteins with different functions, uh, the same way we have uh, structural proteins, uh, we also have uh, messenger proteins, we have uh, receptors, uh, um, we have uh, transcription factors. Uh, and uh, that's why, for instance, you can find proteins not only inside uh, each cell of your body, but also outside. In okay, between so cells, in between them. you have uh, like matrix that is constituted of proteins. Uh, right. But proteins can also travel in your bloodstream uh, to carry different type of information uh, from uh, one organ to another. And since the main topic was uh, I said proteostasis, so what is that exactly? Well, as there are so many proteins uh, mm -hmm. that uh, do different type of jobs. Uh, these, uh, all these activities uh, have to be integrated. Uh, right. And uh, there is a network of proteins or proteome. And uh, each protein influences uh, many other proteins. Uh, so it is important uh, that uh, life of each protein is tightly regulated uh, from the beginning till the end. Mm -hmm. And there is a very complex uh, machinery that ensures this happens. And most of the time we don't even notice it uh, because uh, proteostasis uh, is the, the protein homeostasis, uh, which That's is uh, maintaining the status quo. Right. So if right. you okay. have a network of protein that is working fine, you want it to continue working fine. 
and uh, but unfortunately uh, we are not static entities and our cells are not static entities uh, we are always exposed to small uh, stressors that we don't even perceive as stressors like waking up in the morning or getting exposed to to the sun but uh, these are things that uh, alter the equilibrium or the status quo of this uh, protein network uh, and uh, may possibly damage it so it's important uh, that there is a machinery that makes sure that uh, some, if some alterations in the network occur, uh, the network can still uh, work properly. So from the beginning uh, of the life of a protein, it's important uh, that uh, its structure is exactly that structure, how it's supposed to be and not another. And uh, uh, the protostasis machinery ensures that uh, then uh, during the life of a protein if something happens uh, for instance it loses its structure then uh, the protostasis machinery try to fix it and repair it uh, if not possible then uh, proteins have to be degraded because they are not functional anymore but that's a right. brutal so they help them until a point and then they're like ah you're a lost cause Yes. When you're beyond saving, you're beyond saving. Clearly. <laughs> but luckily, it happens. Uh, it's all meant uh, to integrate uh, uh, not one, but like thousand, billions uh, of proteins to maintain uh, the general status quo, not only of a cell, but of an individual itself. Yeah. And I guess it's kind of like how our hospitals work. We help people until a certain point, and then if they're beyond saving, if they're organ donors, we kind of use. Yes, there are exactly, exactly. Yeah, when no proteins get degraded, uh, they just don't get buried, uh, but uh, they, the components, the amino acids, uh, are recycled so that uh, new proteins can be formed. Okay. So intuitively, I guess that the loss of protostasis is when all these mechanisms that you were talking about somehow fail. Yes, exactly. If you imagine protostasis as a room where you live in, uh, you have to take care of, uh, of the room and tidy it up, uh, clean it up uh, in order for you to live well in yeah. the room. Uh, if you don't clean enough, uh, you end up with uh, dirt and mess. If you clean it too much, uh, you may end up uh, throwing away the sofa that you actually <laughs> need to sit on. So loss of proteostasis is when this uh, complex machinery uh, stops working. And normally we refer as loss of proteostasis uh, as the accumulation of uh, faulty proteins. But of course right. also the other, the the other, other way, way is it's also possible. All right. Okay, but um, so why is that bad? What, like, what do the faulty proteins do? Why is it a bad thing to have them? Can't they just chill out? Well, uh, they could, but they don't, uh, because, uh, as we said, each protein has a specific uh, function. Our body doesn't uh, make a protein just for fun. We make a protein because uh, they have to serve a job. Right. And uh, if a protein is faulty, then uh, it's not able to perform its job properly. Right. And uh, if it's uh, not uh, degraded and uh, becomes, uh, instance, for instance, uh, loses its structure, uh, it is possible that uh, that proteins with a wrong structure is not doing, of course, the job that it's supposed to, but it's doing something else. Um. And maybe this something else uh, is uh, toxic uh, to the cell. Okay. Well. And uh, if uh, too many of these faulty proteins uh, accumulate uh, in a cell, then they tend to aggregate and form these uh, clumps of proteins. Then the bigger they are, the harder it is for them to get uh, further degraded and uh, they really affect uh, the, um, the health uh, yeah. first of a cell and then also of the neighboring cells and then the human self. Eventually. Exactly. Yeah. Eventually, yes. Okay, but I have a question because like all my life my mom and everybody else has always told me to 
eat a lot of pro protein. Like that's one of the main things. Like you have to have a lot of protein in your food. Ha ha ha. But so why is that different? Why is getting more protein that way a good thing and having protein in your body accumulate a bad thing? Like what's the difference here? Well, the difference uh, is that uh, when you eat protein, so uh, what you're actually what your body actually gets uh, is not the ready-made protein, but uh, the proteins you intake uh, will be first uh, degraded to the fundamental components, which are the amino acids. Yeah, right, yeah. And, uh, and then the amino acids uh, will be used uh, by your body to make up fresh proteins according to the need of uh, each cell. Right. So if yeah. you eat uh, too much protein, uh, that's not necessarily good, but uh, it's uh, not bad in the sense that uh, the proteins will not accumulate in your body. Right, so like the extra stuff gets flushed out mostly. They will not be used. Okay, that's, that's good. So kudos to mom and everybody who has told me to eat well. So basically the bottom line is that the proteins you intake are broken down, recycled and you make new ones and that way you don't exactly. get extra because your body doesn't produce more than, than you need anyway. Uh, that's a very clever mechanism. Mm -hmm. Okay. You also mentioned like it can go the other way. Right. Mm -hmm. Like there can be, what, too few proteins? Yes, uh, there are some uh, conditions uh, when uh, the, the degradation machinery uh, doesn't know what to degradate and uh, it's end up uh, throwing away the sofa also, so <laughs> oh, well. start uh, eating up uh, the entire cell. Is like that the, a... What, the cell starts eating up the cell? Yes, it's a self-cannibalism. Is that a common thing? This kind it's of... not a common thing. So it's, then... a, it's normally a medical condition that uh, does not occur. Right, but I meant like okay. since you said that the, the equilibrium could be shifted both ways, mm -hmm. like the, the 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 shift that brings the cell to accumulate junk is more common than the other. Yes. Or okay, yes, so it's, more yeah. common. it's rare also in this sense. Like you don't you don't get like a deficit of proteins because of this often. No. So, okay. No. I mean, humans tend to live in a mess in a mess more than humans tend to Super throw tidy. Off the sofa. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> That's yeah. I'm so point. tidy. That's not a thing. It's, it's, it's like fun. it's normal for students to have like mess around. But if a student suddenly throws over their bed, people are starting to get worried. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah, you can that. cope better with the mess uh, than with a uh, lack of bed to sleep. Uh, well, yeah, it's a fair point. <laughs> fair point. But uh, to bring the topic closer to home, so uh, X10 is dedicated entirely about, you know, dedicated to talking about aging and what science can do against it. Uh, so, what is the relation between uh, loss of protostasis and diseases of aging, such you know Alzheimer's or neurodegenerative diseases, more in general, which is your expertise? Well, loss of protostasis is uh, something that uh, occurs with mm -hmm. aging. It happens to each of us. And uh, as you said, uh, uh, Alzheimer's and other neurodegenerative diseases uh, are um, uh, disorders uh, that are age-related, uh, right. at least some forms of them. So, um, loss of protostasis uh, is uh, a very strong uh, risk to develop uh, neurodegenerative diseases. Uh, and why it's that is if we could uh, um, check brains of patients with neurodegenerative diseases, uh, we would see that uh, they all have uh, uh, clumps and tangles of uh, aggregated proteins, uh, which right. is uh, one uh, of the things that happens when you lose protostasis, uh, when uh, your degradation machinery cannot uh, clear faulty proteins uh, as fast as it, uh, it should. And um, in uh, certain disorders, uh, some uh, of this uh, protein initiate uh, some uh, uh, pathway that becomes very toxic. And uh, neurogenitive disorders are all brain disorders. Uh, and the yes, brain so they start is, there. Uh, they start there. It, it's uh, because the brain is very 
sensitive to loss of proteostasis compared to other organs. It does not uh, regenerate, so if cell starts to, to die, then uh, it's very difficult to get them back. Right. right. Does um, it always start in the brain? Like, well, normally it starts in the brain, but for instance, for uh, Parkinson's disease, yes. another neurodegenerative uh, uh, disorder, uh, it's been proposed that it may actually start in the gut. In the gut we still uh, have uh, neurons, so cells that signal eventually to the to the to the brain and they are physically connected one to another back to the brain but how do you how do you find that out like who who sees someone with parkinson's and is like you know we should look at the stomach <laughs> like how do well, you, when how you is... have somebody with a parkinson then uh, then maybe you don't care about the stomach anymore but uh, it's one of the early symptoms uh, that you may have uh, constipation actually decades uh, before you get diagnosed with uh, with the disease so like chronic constipation for a long time yes that okay so terrible. if you have that go and see a doctor <laughs> regardless <laughs> i mean yeah well regardless but... Them, but you know it's not nice to have anyway but it's also a very good example on how actually loss of proteostasis uh, and the accumulation of pathological proteins is a very long uh, process uh, and actually our brain is very good at buffering and compensating for uh, uh, loss of uh, nerve cells uh, because uh, they start dying decades uh, before you actually uh, experience some brain-related symptoms. You reach the tipping point, basically, yes, where your right, brain so. cannot cope with it anymore. Exactly. So before that, the brain is sort of like compensating, but I mean, I guess that also means that there's no symptoms for doctors to work with. Because exactly, the brain that's is... the problem with uh, neurodegenerative disease. It's harder to diagnose because you don't really see any any telltale sign that could, you know, exactly. suggest that's exactly. the, that the problem is that disease rather than something else. That's yes. a bit of a ironic thing as a double-edged sword yeah like brain is doing its best this, you're doing this, honey let us help you this stuff <laughs> developed when medicine was not a thing so okay so let's see in a thousand again. years maybe evolution will have our brains show symptoms yeah no because <laughs> there isn't enough dying going around for evolution to happen we are too good at preventing people from dying which you know it comes with its own benefits so i'm not complaining just yeah, just true, pointing true, out true, fact yeah. um so like that being said um are there any ways that we can work against loss of protostasis? And I mean, uh, for example, something that we can do on an individual basis or something that science can or could do in the future? Well, science uh, is uh, always at work and always working on some uh, uh, possible ways uh, to uh, interfere with uh, like loss of protostasis or, or any other things that uh, may challenge our health. Um, on the individual uh, point of view, we cannot uh, for do much. Uh -huh. Also, science itself uh, doesn't have a clear picture on how protostasis work. There are thousands of uh, players, uh, the, the machinery is uh, very complicated and we still don't know how each player is connected to another player. Right. But uh, for instance, uh, it has been shown that uh, fasting does boost uh, your degradation, uh, protein degradation machinery. And uh, in animal studies, uh, they demonstrate that uh, if uh, animals fast, uh, then uh, they have longer lifespan. They live longer and just like because they healthier. eat less uh, and healthier. Oh. Yeah. It doesn't work with humans as well. Well, with humans, it's a bit more tricky, more difficult to assess. Uh, but uh, some studies seem to point in the same direction. Okay, so that will be like as long as you do it with a doctor's consent and everything. You can't just start skipping meals. But yeah, no. I guess that's like that would be something that individuals would do then. Yes, it makes sense uh, from. Uh, a molecular point of view because uh, 
your body gets the signal that uh, oh, there is no food, we must uh, do something. Right. And this is one of the small the st stressors yeah. that we were yeah, talking about before. Exactly. Yeah. It starts recycling as a response to that. It starts uh, shutting down all the functions that are not uh, fundamental, fundamental for survival. Okay. So everything that is not needed for the short-term survival, mm -hmm. it's not needed. Right. So it's thrown away. the proteins that are not needed in that specific moment, they get degraded uh, and the components right. recycled. So this helps postponing at least uh, the insurgence of diseases because they, they kind of accumulate more slowly. Yes, yeah. I understand. Or degrade faster. Right. So okay. even like the, the fasting can produce this effect, but I'm guessing that even even if you don't eat too much, that is <laughs> sort of beneficial. <laughs> Right. Yes, yes. yes. Over, overeating this. is not a good thing either. Yeah, because that no. adds problems on top, like, yeah. on top but, of, of uh, also for just so like you can get too fat and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah, yes. But are there other ways besides fasting that we can control this whole thing? You mean individually? Yeah, individually. For the loss of proteostasis, uh, I can't think of any. But uh, of course, uh, then if we talk uh, about uh, diseases that are related to loss of proteostasis, uh, then uh, the adoption of the strategy be healthy, stay healthy works. So some common sense things like... Do what your grandma would say, just to stay on top of Exactly. <laughs> like eat well, do exercise, uh, train your brain. All these things have been shown to reduce the risk uh, right. of developing uh, a neurodegenerative uh, uh, disease, uh, but then uh, for if, if we go back to the uh, healthy thing, is that you may say like, yeah, this is just common sense. Of course, if you're healthy, you're, you you mm. live better. But then actually, science corroborated uh, some of this uh, um, of this grandma saying. And for instance, now we know that uh, eating fish which contains uh, polyunsaturated fatty acids uh, uh, help uh, at the molecular level to reduce the spreading of toxic proteins in your brain. Mm -hmm. And uh, as another example, components of green tea also help uh, disaggregate uh, the um, big clumps of right. uh, aggregating proteins uh, that uh, in the old days uh, you end up uh, having in your brain. Ah. So all this common sense uh, saying has actually some scientific uh, background. Okay. That's now I understand know. the Japanese more, like they have it yes. figured out clearly. Do they drink yeah. a lot of green tea specifically? What? I think they, they, they drink specifically yeah, 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 yeah. green tea. And I mean sushi. Fish. Fair enough, yeah man. That explains. I know what I'm talking about. Of course you do. <laughs> so, um... But, yeah. Oh. Right. About the science, like, there's, I guess, some trials going on. You said that they are trying to work towards that. And I think we've, in a previous video, we have also mentioned that there are some clinical trials. Uh, well, there we have a video about protostasis, as said, where we mentioned a couple of um, things that are being tried out, uh, that are being, I think, um, probably in early clinical, uh, either early clinical phases or even preclinical, and you can also give a look at our rejuvenation roadmap where uh, we talk more in detail about what is being try uh, trying for all of the hallmarks, not just loss of protostasis, but there are some cool initiatives that you should definitely go and have a look at. Yeah. Yeah. But right, so I. At least I think uh, my my thirst for uh, for knowledge has been quenched for the time being. I've uh, learned so, so much. I think I have a better understanding than I had before about protostasis and the loss of it and how it works in aging or rather age-related diseases and hopefully how science will help us fight it back and what we can do on the individual level to help a little bit. So thank you very much for joining us and for Welcome. teaching us about these things. Yeah, thank you so much. and. Thank you everyone for watching this and um, if you like this episode and want to tell us something about it, comment, questions, anything, do that down below or click the like button and of course subscribe. And speaking of which, X10 is actually moving to its own channel soon. And 
we'll talk about that in the future episodes as well. But you know, stay tuned to have more info. Yeah. yeah. And of course, last but not least, we would like to thank the Lifespan heroes who are the supporters who donate to Lifespan.io monthly. Lifespan.io is our parent organization, and that allows us to make this show, allows to run crowdfunding campaigns for research on aging, and run the blog, organize conferences, and a lot more. So if you think that's useful or interesting, and you would like to help us do that, you can become a Lifespan hero yourself. And to do that, just head over to lifespan.io slash hero and make your pledge. Great. I guess that's it. That's that. Okay. Thanks for today. Thanks to you. Thanks to Cecilia. Cecilia. I mispronounce my own language. All right. I lost it. Okay. See you guys next time. See you next time. Bye.